Well, here we are for some of us after a bit of a struggle through some blocked streets or not so functioning metro. But here we are on this morning, this turning point weekend. It's the beginning of the summer, at least according to all the commercials. It is post all the graduation festivities, the hard work of the year. It's a time to get away. We hope and pray that those who have gotten away may be tuning in through our broadcast of the service this day. It is a turning point in our society's experience of the year, and it's also a turning point in the church year. For here we are at Trinity Sunday, Holy Trinity Sunday, the turning point from the intensity of the Jesus cycles of the church year, from his anticipation of his birth and then his birth through the epiphany and the growing light into the journey with him to his passion and death and then the joyful resurrection, the seven weeks of living out that joy, the gift of the Holy Spirit last week and today, Holy Trinity Sunday is the turning point into the long green season of summer. It is the day, in my experience at least, when the associate pastor or the seminarian usually preaches. <laughs> because tackling the concept of the Holy Trinity, the one Sunday of the whole year in which we celebrate a concept, can be not such a fun task. I have heard and probably preached more than my share of boring sermons along the lines of this from, believe it or not, the Wikipedia definition of Trinity. The Christian doctrine of the Trinity, from Latin, trinitas, triad, from trinus, threefold, defines God as three consubstantial persons, expressions, or hypostases, the Father, the Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, one God in three persons. The three persons are distinct, yet are one substance, essence, or nature. In this context, the definition concludes, a nature is what one is, while a person is who one is. Got it? <laughs> when I was at the University of Missouri, I, I used to say that my students would know that you just take that paragraph, you rework it a little bit, and then you put it in your paper, and you're done. Either that, or I've heard or participated in my share of cute analogies, often in the children's sermon, but sometimes in the regular sermon, they usually, more often than not, stray into heresy. There's ice, water, and steam. There's creator, redeemer, sanctifier, which we could get into a discussion about that in a class sometime. All of it, though, all of it today, on a warm, humid weekend that kicks off summer in the U.S., could be done in a short manner, a short theological sermon, in fact, on a, this warm, humid day, a talk, a homily, a teaching talk. It might be boring, but it would be the safest way to get us out the door and to brunch or the pool. But as you may have guessed, I'm not going there. Instead, I have found myself this week this rich and full week in which I had the blessing of being a part of the festival of homiletics, experiencing inspired preachers pouring out the Holy Spirit through their hearts and minds and strength into an embodied word about the intersection of religion and our public life, our politics. I have found myself today at the end of that week unable to preach a disembodied examination of the doctrine of the Holy Trinity. 
not because it would not be accurate or even important. It is essential, in fact, to take time to dwell in the mystery of God, to examine what we believe and profess. But this week, this day, when my news feed has been overwhelmed by the story of 1,500 children ripped from their parents, placed into holding cells, and lost, some to human traffickers, 1,500 children beloved by their parents, fragile, vulnerable children of God, 1,500 children frightened, crying, not understanding what has happened or why, 1,500 children whom we may never find 1,500 children taken at the border by U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement officers, in other words, by our tax dollars at work. 1,500 children lost to the system, but not lost to God. Well, in the face of that, I had to ask myself, what does it matter that we confess that God is one substance and three persons? What does it matter that our church here is turning green next week? What does it matter that we are doing any of this? Uh, but then I turned to the text. The biblical text for today that the creators of the lectionary wisely placed before us. And here I found not dry definitions of the Trinity, but a living witness to an awesome holy being who fills every corner of the universe with love. One who, yes, is wholly other because this one is so unutterably beautiful and perfect and powerful and holy, but not because this one is remote or distant or uninvolved. This holy one is inextricably woven into the fabric of our world given to us in the sun. The one who came into the world, not to condemn the world, but to save it. In the face of such holiness, we fall down on our faces. We take a knee. We become all too aware of the ways we fall short of our own sinful lips and lives, not just as individuals, but as a nation, as a people, as part of the collective existence of humanity in a world where we allow children to be ripped from their parents, where we ignore the ravages of our own sinfulness, where we at times wonder if any of this has any purpose or hope, where we doubt the existence of the love that seeks always to reach us with its transformative new life. Sometimes, overwhelmed by the sheer weight of the horribleness in our world, we despair of making any difference. And we wonder if it's even okay to enjoy our lives. <laughs> Some of you may be wishing right now that I'd opted for the brief, if boring, theological message. Can't we just enjoy Memorial Day weekend, Pastor Kathy? <laughs> One of the preachers this week, she preached, I believe it was on Thursday, Reverend Yvette Flunder, among others who brought up this theme, shared that concern with all of us. That is, those of us who preach, who live among God's faithful people, we can at times share with so many of you the sense that the bad in this world has drowned out the good, that indeed we have good reason to feel like the joy is gone and things will never be right again. But, she among others said, if we preach that, 
We miss the deeper truth of the biblical witness. We miss the deeper reality of our living God. Take a look at today's texts again. All of them there on that last inside page of the bulletin. Look at what happens when we fall down before the Holy One, grieving our own sinfulness and the brokenness of the world. God reaches out in love, in healing, the coal extended to our lips, the sun lifted on the cross, the spirit of adoption, the spirit of adoption, not of fear, poured out upon us and through us so that we may cry out, Abba, so that we may not perish but have eternal life. In the end, the love that created this universe that fills every last bit of it will not let us go, and that love has the last word. In other words, love wins. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Let's say that together. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. The one who sent the only begotten son has not forgotten the children in those jail cells at the border, nor has that one given up on sending us to make a difference. For here's the thing. When we take a knee, in awareness of our collective sinfulness and the awesome wonder of God's holiness. When we rise through the death and resurrection of Christ and when we receive the spirit poured out in and through us, we are then called. Called. We, Heirs of glory are asked if we are willing to go, to be sent in the name of love to serve a hurting and broken world, that all, all, no exceptions, all may share in the new life that this Holy One is always sharing within the divine being, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, an endless relationship of love. And we, strengthened by the new life that we have received, filled with the joy of the hope that cannot be destroyed by this awful world, we say, yes, here I am, send me. When Rachel held Evans posted about the situation with the children at the border this week on Facebook, she did not only share the story of the crying children and the anguished parents, she shared link after link in her comments under her post on Facebook about how people can get involved and make a difference. I'll share this to the Augustana Facebook page for those who want to pour their hearts into this particular situation. But in whatever way you are called, know that the Holy Spirit is inviting you, sending you, even compelling you, moved by the Spirit, not only to be willing to walk into the places of suffering, to suffer with Christ, but also to join in the dance of joy that is the ever-loving Trinity, the lover, beloved, and spirit of love, as St. Augustine called the Holy Trinity. To join in the dance of joy. That with Miriam, who sang and danced by the Red Sea to celebrate God's deliverance, we are called to testify with our hands and our feet and our hearts and our voices to testify with our very lives to the triumph of love. For God is already at work in the world, at work 
in the ones who have given their lives for others, including those whom we will remember in this country tomorrow, at work in those serving this day and tomorrow who find ways to weave the strands of love into the gaping tears in the fabric of our common life the Holy One whose life, whose love, whose joy fills every corner of this beloved universe is not through with that universe and is not through with us yet. The Holy One whose endless dance of life continues to repair the effects of our own sinfulness invites us to the dance, invites us to the work of tikkun olam, of repairing the world, and yes, invites us to joy this day. Let us celebrate the meal that gives us strength, the love that will not let us go, and then let us say to this Holy One in Three, yes, here I am, send me.